Watch this. Impeached for a second time. But that may not be enough when it comes to accountability for what happened last week at our nation's capital. How the 14th Amendment could still be used against the outgoing president. A new mural tucked into a downtown Boise alleyway is more than art. It's a message. And we're hoping you get this message. This tiny North Idaho town has been called a lot of things. Probably incorrectly. Hey, wipe that smile off your face. Yes, President Trump was impeached today for the second time during his term in office. The impeachment stems from the events at the U.S. Capitol a week ago when the rhetoric used by President Donald Trump helped to incite an insurrection that included a mob storming the Capitol. That mob destroyed federal property, threatened members of Congress. The impeachment process will now move to the Senate where they will vote on whether to convict the president. There's also a tension, though, on members of Congress who some believe were also responsible for pr promoting that riot at the Capitol. Calls for accountability there have been extended to those lawmakers that are accused of throwing gasoline on the fire by pushing theories of a stolen election. The 14th Amendment has been brought up as the mechanism for that accountability. Joe Paris spoke with a University of Idaho law professor who is an expert on the Constitution, and she, ex she explains how the 14th Amendment could come into play. The 14th Amendment covers a lot of ground, but one specific section deals with the word that many had not used until a week ago insurrection and that's defined as a violent uprising against any authority or government which is how many are characterizing the riot at the u.s capitol section three of the 14th amendment talks about the removal or disqualifications from the house of representatives or the senate if one has engaged in an insurrection or rebellious behavior university of idaho professor of law shakira sanders is a constitutional expert with calls for accountability for members of Congress who some believe helped inspire the insurrection at the Capitol, she explains how Section 3 of the 14th Amendment can be used to remove a member of Congress. Removal requires a two-thirds vote and uh, for if you're a member of the House, a two-thirds vote of the House. If you're a member of the Senate, a two-thirds vote of the Senate to remove you. The 14th Amendment is a part of the Reconstruction Amendments, which were passed immediately after the Civil War. Section 3 was drafted to address those in public office that were a part of the Confederacy, which rebelled against the Union. And that whole process of seceding, a lot of that was driven by members of the Senate and the House of Representatives at that time. And so I think the goal of those second founders, as we call them after the Civil War, is to prevent any member of the federal government from engaging in behavior that is not in their best interest of the federal government or that would lead uh, to uh, the dissolution of the federal government. That idea is accomplished in the 14th Amendment with that special provision for those in public office who are found to have been part of the so-called insurrection events. You can also be disqualified from ever holding uh, a office in the federal government on the basis of an insurrection or uh, rebellion. To be clear, the 14th Amendment is broad and includes more than just members of Congress. It says in part that no person shall hold any office, civil or military, that previously took the oath to support the Constitution of the United States and engage in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. While the 14th Amendment could not be used to remove President Trump, it is believed that Section 3 could be used to prevent him from ever holding public office again. For now, though, it's wait and see if lawmakers in Washington pursue that option. As a part of the current impeachment process, Congress could vote to prevent President Trump from holding office again. Professor Sanders says if that doesn't happen, there are also other ways President Trump could be disqualified from holding office again. For the president, if he's impeached but not convicted, i.e. removed, then after he ends, the presidency ends, it very well could be that there are criminal charges. And if he, the president is convicted as a private citizen, the president could be prevented from rerunning for office, which of course the president has the option to do after only one term. All right, Joe, you mentioned nobody has used that term insurrection very frequently up until, well, last week. But how likely and how would Congress use this 14th Amendment? 
If it were for a member of Congress, Brian, it would have to likely come through a piece of legislation that would essentially just invoke the 14th Amendment. And then as Professor Sanders explained, if it was in the House, you would then have to have two thirds of the House say that, yes, that we agree that this person should be removed and barred from holding public office. Same thing over in the Senate. Right now, uh, really, the priorities seem to be focused on President Trump and the impeachment effort. But there is talk on Capitol Hill in Washington that there could be some attempts to hold other members of Congress accountable for what some have called their push for the insurrection as well. Yeah, still a week left in this administration. We'll see what happens after that because those in Congress, well, they could still be held accountable even after the inauguration next week. All right, thanks, Joe. Well, before today's impeachment vote, members of the House were called to the House chambers late last night to vote on a resolution regarding the 25th Amendment. But before they could get inside the chambers, they had to go through newly installed metal detectors, which were put there after last week's attempted coup on the Capitol. Metal detectors that were usually reserved for staff, reporters, and visitors. So you can imagine the displeasure of some of the representatives, mostly Republicans. And you can probably not really have to imagine. You may have seen some pictures or heard of it or seen some of that displeasure. While there weren't a lot of them, pictures and video of such things, Huffington Post reporter Matt Fuller watched and reported what he saw several of them do. Live tweeting what he saw, Fuller says at least 12 House members, all from the GOP, either set off the alarm, kept walking, or sidestepped the process altogether, including Idaho's Russ Fulcher. Last night he tweeted, quote, another member, I believe it was Russ Fulcher, just pushed his way through. He went through the metal detector, set it off, ran into a cop, and then pushed his way past her. This morning, Fuller said, he, he says, uh, Representative Russ Fulcher sees reporters staking out the door where he passed, pushed past a cop to get through to the House floor. He walks through a different door, does it again, thinking he's out of sight, but I followed him. As an aside, Russ Fulcher was the most aggressive member pushing through the metal detectors last night, Fuller added this morning. A female officer kind of got in his way, I think inadvertently, and he really was assertive. The cop didn't want to talk, but she almost seemed on the verge of tears after. We haven't seen any video or pictures of what Fuller uh, or Fulcher allegedly did, so we reached out to Representative Fulcher to find out what happened. His response, he supplied to social media, saying this about what happened. The Capitol Police are heroes. I continue to support and thank them for their service. Yesterday, metal detectors and members and member screening procedures were initiated at entrances of the House chamber, unauthorized via House rule. Info thus far shows the events on January 6th came from outside, not from members. Member screening puts our Capitol Police in an awkward position of screening those they are there to protect redirects resources away from outside threats and implies members are a threat to one another, a notion I reject. I and other members communicated to the Sergeant at Arms, or the acting Sergeant at Arms actually, that we would not be participating with the new screening procedure until we know House rules were followed. Lastly, I am unaware of any rude interactions between members and Capitol Police. Those relationships are extremely positive. Now we need to build similar relations between one another. Congressman Fulcher and the rest of the House of Representatives were there to debate and vote on the second impeachment of outgoing President Donald Trump. He, along with Idaho Congressman Mike Simpson, voted no on the article of impeachment. Our Congress legislative process was put in place to facilitate debate, improve ideas, and ensure minority voices, voices are heard throughout through these official processes. Well, this is a letter that he sent, by the way, that accompanied that statement that came with uh, what he said about the metal detector incident or alleged incident. So he sent this letter to the uh, House of Representatives, to Nancy Pelosi, uh, the majority speaker of the House. Of, uh, so this is what he went on to say. Processes have been trampled by Speaker Pelosi's recent rule changes to lessen the voices of the minority party. Fact that remains, there is a process. The attacks on our Capitol on January 6th have no place in politics. On January 20th, the process will take place to inaugurate a new president. And I believe if our republic is to survive, we must respect that. I anticipate this will be made only more difficult and divisive by further attempts to impeach President Trump in the House with only days left in his term and without proper hearings or investigations taking place. As reiterated in my attached letter to the speaker sent January night, this is not the time to drive the partisan wedge deeper. So yeah, this is that letter I was talking about actually. He sent that letter to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi that expressed similar sentiments as that statement saying, these actions could instead incite civil unrest at a level that would make Seattle, Minneapolis, and D.C. look like minor incidents, basically equating protests or civil liberties with an attack on our democracy. 
Fulcher went on to say Americans have had enough this past year. That statement could be interpreted more than one way. 232 other House members, including 10 Republicans, interpreted it to mean they've had enough of the current president. And President Trump became the first U.S. president to ever be impeached twice. The Trump administration expected to survive the next seven days, though, with the Senate likely not looking at those impeachment charges until next Tuesday. President-elect Biden will take office next Wednesday. It's a big message of hope tucked away in a quiet Boise alleyway, one the artist hopes will spark a conversation. We want to spark a conversation with you. Send us your comments, your questions, and yes, even your complaints to the number on your screen, 208-321-5614. Be sure to include your name and the hashtag the 208. We'll respond to a few of them at the end of the show. A nation in turmoil, the pandemic, economic uncertainty, isolation. We could all use a little bit more inspiration these days. A moment in our busy lives to just feel better. There's a reminder of that in downtown Boise. And the next time you're there, look around. You'll find it. Here's Kim Fields with the story. In an unexpected location. Around the corner in a small alley in downtown Boise, a reassuring message. The message keeping your future alive is is just that, right? Keep, keep it going. You know, you, you there's there's more to there's more that comes after. You know, if you have a long day, you know, there's another day, and there there's there's going to be more opportunity for you to to make you know your your day better, your your future better. And it starts sometimes with small steps. Mural artist Bobby Gatan kept the message simple. Just four words. The deeper inspiration, he says, is found in the details. Just, hey, there's mm -hmm. this happy girl, little girl that, you know, there's hope. You know, there's hope. But she's, she has this little balloon that staring back at her and winking at her and saying, hey, you know, you got this. You know, so to me, those little things as an artist, I try to include uh, very subtle, but hopefully making a, a big impact for people, you know. Every day is a new day, you know, and every day is a new day to make something out of your your life and your and whatever it is, you know, and we have an opportunity to be fortunate to to wake up and, 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 and tell ourselves, you know what, um, I have this new day where I can make a change. Bobby's mural is one of four throughout downtown Boise, all with empowering messages. A reminder, you are loved. It's okay to ask for help. Murals and window paintings, creative ways to reduce the stigma, to remind people if you are struggling, someone is always there at the Idaho Suicide Prevention Hotline. You can reach out anytime and you don't need to be suicidal to call. If you just need somebody to talk to, sometimes that's all we need. And um, for, for me to have uh, 
you know, that available in our community, it's a big deal. And I think uh, I just jumped on it as soon as I got the opportunity. And I, I hope everybody and everyone that sees it uh, feels the same way uh, and feels like it brings a smile to, to them or anything positive in their day, you know, even just if they're walking by and see it and, and smile is, it's, to me, that's a big, that's the goal. Advertising agency Drake Cooper worked with the Idaho Suicide Prevention Hotline on this new marketing campaign at no cost. Every year, Drake Cooper chooses a nonprofit organization and helps them develop unique branding. And this couldn't come at a better time for the hotline because they are trying to change their branding, their messaging. They want people to know, even though it's part of their organization's name, you don't need to be suicidal to call them. So if you or someone you know is struggling and you just need someone to talk to, remember, Help is always available. Just call the hotline at 208-398-4357. It's where the Lewis and Clark expedition met the Nez Perce people, which has something to do with what it's called. But how do you say the name of this panhandle town? Is there something about Idaho you're curious about? Send us your Idaho-related questions that could lead to the next feature story here on the 208. That number, 208-321-5614. Include your name and the hashtag, well, the 208. It is nice to see the sunshine that we had for today. And of course it came out this afternoon. The cost of it is some gusty winds and we're gonna be getting cooler once again. I'm gonna start out just to let you know that we do have avalanche warnings that are in effect in the mountains up around McCall, also in the mountains around Sun Valley and just to the north. And I should say, just be careful because any mountain locations after you've had these warmer temperatures like we've had, uh, we could be seeing these conditions take place because the new snow is just not going to stick to the old snow quite as easily with some of these differences in temperature. So it could be a little dangerous. And those uh, avalanche warnings are in effect till 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. 
This is the amount of rain for most spots, generally uh, about a tenth of an inch in many locations. And the high today, hope you enjoyed it. If it wasn't for the wind, because the temperatures uh, started out at 8 o'clock this morning at 48, and we had a high of 50, and now they're starting to go down. Winds are down the northwest at 10 miles an hour from Boise. Same thing for Ontario. If you look at uh, the maximum wind gust, uh, Boise had a 28 mile an hour wind gust, Napa 29, so pretty close to 30. Caldwell 32, and Twin Falls with uh, 41 miles an hour. Now, you heard earlier this morning at around sunrise that uh, Spokane had a wind gust of 71 miles an hour. Their winds were 50 to 60 miles an hour for most of the day. So with the winds, this puts our wind chill around 40 degrees and could be dropping down into the 30s for tonight. In fact, we could see wind chills um, even into the upper 20s at some times overnight. But here's the good news. Here's your ski area. Uh, Bogus Basin has four new inches. Look at Brundage. Nearly a foot there, and the same thing for Tamarack. Well, they had nine new inches, and then as you look at Sun Valley, it was four inches of new snow. So far this evening, we remain dry. Temperatures drop down to about 26 degrees for tomorrow morning. The winds will stop in the middle of the night, and that means some areas of fog could start to form. little concerned about any slick spots of any standing water, but it looks like things are pretty much drying up around the area. So 40 degrees will be the high temperature tomorrow, and you see the rest of the week, Temperatures will be right around 40 degrees for the high. Uh, you see even into Sunday, 43 degrees. And overnight lows will be below freezing for the next several days. And we're not looking for many storms. Most of the storms will be to our north, which means that we will stay pretty much on the dry side uh, here for the next several days. But we will be some, seeing some of those clouds. Now that's your weather forecast. Thanks for joining me. Well, Idaho has a rich history, as we know, that has a deep attachment to its Native American roots. With that comes a lot of Native American place names that, well, don't always roll off the non-native tongue very well. Which is why we're bringing back a favorite segment of ours. One where we try to help us and, and help you learn about this great state. Because how can you get there or tell people where you're going if you don't know how to say where you're going? Well, we can't go anywhere right now. So we crashed our sales team meeting for tonight's edition of How Do You Say It? There's a tiny town in Clearwater County with a name that's a bit... Can you see that? I can. Unclear. I would say, um, wipe. Good guess. It's a good guess. Weepy? Weepy, is that how you would say that? Yeah, I think it's either weepy or wipey or weep. I don't know. You know who does know? Those that live and work there, like David Thompson. How do you say that? We say it, weipe. Weipe. My wife and I, we moved up here in 2008. We thought it was going to be this beautiful word like Wyape, something to that effect. And we get here, we turn, turns out that it's just Weipe. Just Weipe? It's just the place where Lewis and Clark first met the Nez Perce in 1805. Weipe. But its origins are unfortunately just as unclear. And what Weipe means, also up for debate. It's also not the only question in this small town. Like, why is there a gorilla on the water tower? And how old is their mayor, the longest serving mayor in Idaho, who's been in office since 1968? We'll save those for another day. But the name, Weipe, well, it even has its own YouTube video. The name of the town is Weipe, Idaho. Not Weepy, Wipey, or We Wipe. Weipe, Idaho. All right, we got it. But that also leads us to our next question. What do you call yourselves? A lot of us call us Weipers. 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 Wow, okay. I'm sure that's been messed up a few times. <laughs> that is for sure. Because we've had people call this Wipey. So that would make you guys Wipers if that were the case. We wouldn't want to be the Wipers. No, you don't want to be the Wipers. The meaning of the word Weipe has been also hard to nail down. It either has something to do with how old the place is, maybe something to do with the spring of water, or it could be the Camas flower according to weipe.com. As for the eight-foot gorilla on the water tower, it used to be the high school mascot from 1927 until 1970, and then the middle school mascot until 1989. Timberline High School, which is what they share with Pierce next door, well, they're now the Spartans, but the town wanted to keep the gorilla alive for posterity. The mayor, Norm Stedman, who turned 83 last November and was honored by Governor Butch Otter in 2017 for being the longest serving mayor in Idaho, He's still in charge and he still plows the roads when needed, which shows you, you can't wipe out Weipers very easily.
A lot of comments today sent in about uh, Congressman Russ Fulcher and him trying to bypass House security. This sent in should be uh, Representative Fulcher should be ashamed of his actions in trying to bypass Capitol security. Does he do the same when getting on a plane or entering a courthouse? A little solidarity and compliance with security measures would set a better example for everyone. Representative Fulcher should understand that following up impeachment on what happened on the 6th isn't about furthering the divide. It is to say our country, well, this was not acceptable. His contribution should be examined too, if not by his peers, by US, by us, I should say, in the next election. That's sent in by Doug. Brian, it must be okay to, well, I guess she thinks we're doing a little tattletaling these days for not complying with the Capitol Police, the security contractors, deal with people going in and out. We just kind of like to point out maybe a couple of hypocrisy moments from our leaders who say one thing like back the blue, but then allegedly kind of just neglect their orders when it comes to that and even brushes past them aggressively. So when a president is impeached but still in office, what can he do or what does he do when he has to leave office? Basically, it's just a black mark on his record. Nothing really happens at this point. So we'll see what happens next week.